Now I want to bring in uh, both attorney Mark Reichel and White House columnist at the Hill, Niall Stanich. Gentlemen, I want to start with your impressions of the former president's remarks tonight. And, and let's start with you, Niall. As we said, a lot to unpack. But first, what stood out to you? And second, did anything surprise you? So a few things stood out. One was the attack on President Biden for, uh, as President, former President Trump put it, vilifying uh, him, uh, President Trump and his supporters, and vilifying the nation. And that was part of a broader argument we heard from the former president, saying, for example, that the Biden administration is trying to silence you, telling his supporters they're trying to silence you. That seems to me a big thrust of his argument. A couple of other things briefly. He didn't really mention uh, Mehmet Oz or Doug Mastriano until really quite late in his remarks. Now, I know those remarks get repackaged in subsequent news coverage. Maybe Pennsylvania stations will pick up on more of what he said about the races in that state. But at a rally that was ostensibly to build support for those Republican candidates, he didn't really say very much about them. And relatedly, and this will be uh, the final point that I have for now, uh, it took him about 40 minutes or so before he mentioned things like gas prices, before he mentioned things like Republican support for policing. Those are the kind of issues that the GOP wants to fight these midterm elections on. And if you were watching this speech live, you had to wade through a lot of the former president's uh, greatest hits, I suppose we, should, we could say, until you got to those issues. Absolutely. And I do want to bring you in as well, Mark. You know, as someone who's under investigation by the Department of Justice and Congress's top intelligence official, is the former president doing himself any favors? No, I mean, I, I think there's no dispute that he has the worst legal counsel I think we've ever seen. You have to understand, we really are at core, at bottom, we are a nation of laws and not a, a man or, you know, a group of men. We are a nation of laws. The Department of Justice is paying no attention to this. This former president is literally speaking into an echo chamber of, you know, sympathetic ears. But if the Department of Justice may look for one or two things where he acknowledges culpability or guilt, they're not going to be deterred. Federal criminal court is really a chess match, a high stakes, slow and deliberate chess match. My significant other always says federal court is just one step back from the powdered wigs. That's the words from Elizabeth every morning when I go to federal court. Now, I will tell you, Garland, the attorney general here is setting this piece by piece. Yesterday, significant in a filing, they noted that on May 21st, when they sent out the subpoena, they requested all documents. The president later said he gave all of them and then said, I didn't have to give some of them. The federal grand jury is entitled to everyone's evidence in America. It's just how the law is. Everything he's doing today is really outside the criminal law. The, the Department of Justice is listening for admissions, but they're not here with popcorn watching this because it's entertaining. They have a mission, and Mr. Trump is being so served so poorly by his attorneys, he's making it worse every day that he does this. And, and Niall, you know, I want to pick back up on our conversation earlier about Republican infighting. You know, the divide within the GOP continues to widen. Uh, at first, we were talking about how Trump attacked Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, and Evan was speaking to that as well. That happened last week. He called him his wife crazy, called for him to be replaced. And now we're seeing Florida Senator Rick Scott calling McConnell out as well, saying that he shouldn't be bashing party candidates. How seriously are Republicans dividing themselves ahead of the midterms? Pretty seriously. I mean, Rick Scott is the head of the Republican Senate campaign arm. This is not some obscure backbench senator we're talking about. And for him to go at Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate in that way, is pretty striking. As far as former President Trump and Senator McConnell's relationship, it, that's barely a relationship, honestly. I mean, the, the extent to which they tolerate each other even is quite minimal. And as you say, we saw former President Trump attack Senator McConnell again um, tonight. The the point there about the, as it pertains to the elections, I think is, is twofold. One, which you and I were talking about earlier, Natasha, is this sense of recriminations preceding the elections. The other point is setting all ideology or all party identification aside. Voters typically don't like divided parties because they feel if a party is fighting within itself or against itself, how is it going to be able to effectively deal with the problems that I want government to solve? 
And so I think it is a pretty perilous uh, trend for the Republican Party. And we saw uh, Mr. Trump throw a little more gasoline on the flames there tonight. And back to you, Mark, you know, I want to talk about the big new details coming out of the raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. An inventory of the items taken from the resident shows FBI agents found dozens of empty folders labeled classified with no clues as to what may have been inside of them. So, Mark, does this mean more searches are coming and could this be used against the former president in any criminal investigation? It absolutely look if it makes it into that file that is well documented there is a very strong paper trail on how things get into those files when it when it shows up empty later it's easy to trace who's the last person that put it in there yes it's it absolutely is conscious as we go it shows us this is much more serious the department of justice isn't just having a raid now they're going to have a disagreement about whether you should have given us something there's they are really on red alert for searching what happened they're cross-checking as we know with them with the ndi you know the department of intelligence to see are there cia leaks now are there human sources compromised this is singularly the most significant criminal investigation in the history of the department of justice and it's a 250 year old country that's been doing this and Mark, if I can stay with you for a moment, you know, former Attorney General Bill Barr this week also said that his former boss had, quote, no justification to keep the classified documents in Florida. What kind of weight does a statement like this from a former attorney general hold? For 31 years, I have been doing one thing, and that's fighting the federal government and federal court. After 9-11, I was appointed to represent a lot of people charged with domestic terrorism. Trust me, I, he's a former opponent of mine, Mr. Barr. For him to come out and to say this, he is as conservative as law and order, as supportive of the Trump administration during its presidency as anyone. In fact, many will say he wrote the memo saying we can't charge the man with a crime in response to the special counsel Mueller's investigation. For him to say exactly what I'm saying, there's no defense to this. You cannot possess them, even if you say you declassified them during the presidency, which did not happen. That's made up, okay? Even if you say you did that, you can't possess them. They stay behind after you declassify them. What William Barr said should be the death knell. What do you think Merrick Garland is saying? Mark, I hear you. And Niall, back to you. You know, listening to this speech, Trump is going to be Trump, certainly. With a speech like this, are we seeing any evidence of Trump courting more moderate Republicans, or is he really squarely speaking to his base here? To my mind, he's squarely speaking to his base. And we saw that particularly in the long, early stretches of the speech. And uh, there is an effectiveness in terms of mobilizing the Trump base in him doing what we just described as his greatest hits, in him reciting the various grievances that he has. But does that persuade anyone who isn't already convinced? I doubt it, honestly. I mean, are moderate voters considering who they're going to vote for this November really going to be swayed by insults of Adam Schiff, for example, the prominent Democratic congressman, by a recitation of former President Trump's battles with Hillary Clinton, uh, by various other um, complaints about Robert Mueller, who was, just, who was just mentioned. Even setting aside the veracity of those claims, which in some cases is very, very questionable, the efficacy of them in reaching out to moderate voters seems highly doubtful to me. That's purely about serving red meat to the Trump base. I mean, I hear you. And Niall, you know, we, did we see a bigger argument from him in his speech tonight that the investigations of him are attacks by proxy on his supporters? And if so, do you think that strategy could be politically effective with his supporters? Yes and yes is the short answer to that. It was one of the most striking uh, elements to me in how he spoke about the raid and investigation in Mar-a-Lago. He was very much seeking to suggest that that is an, an attack not just on him, but on his supporters. He frames this rather dubiously, in my view, as an, a sort of attack of the deep state on him and his people. Now, where that is politically effective is in exciting that base, making it seem like there are absolutely existential questions uh, at, at play in any election that is to come, and in getting those voters to the polls. The 
veracity of them, as I say, doubtful the political e efficacy could uh, could be effective in my in my view. And, and you were saying before uh, that Trump expended a certain amount of political capital stumping for Mastriano and Dr. Oz, and and the polling is showing that Democrats are leading in those races. So how does it impact Trump if they do lose? Badly, because it really goes to the whole idea of his capacity to divide the country and to be, broadly speaking, unpopular with the general population, even though, of course, he's very popular with his own base. There are Republican Trump doubters, and um, some of them don't yet choose to come into the open, but I certainly know from my own conversations that there are people who acknowledge that he is the favorite to win the Republican nomination in 2020, 2020 well, sorry, 2024, um, if he contests that nomination, but they worry about the baggage that he brings. So if we now have Trump-backed candidates at the very least in danger of losing in battleground states, that fuels the Trump skeptic argument and undercuts the former president's case for his own candidacy. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.